Amen. God bless. Well, it's good to be here in the house of the Lord once again to come before the Lord with praise and with thanksgiving on our hearts and just to worship him and thank him for all that he's doing in each one of our lives. And uh, I'm excited. I hope you had read, listened, or went over the teaching of last week uh, in the presence of God. What I mean, this is so strong in my spirit. And I hope it is on yours because I'm telling you, listen to me very closely. You cannot make it in this world on just your salvation. You will be defeated. Whoa, it got quiet in here, except for the kids. That's because they're having a joyful time with Miss Vicky. And one of you is going to be her helper or two or three or four. And get to hear that joyful outreach of those children's hearts. Amen. But I'm serious. It's so difficult. And this is only the beginning of birth pains. This is, we're we're just barely on the precipice of entering into this evil times. And if you've ever read or if you're in, in uh, Pastor Frank's class, when we're talking about the, the, the revelation, the, the end times, I mean, we're talking about the tribulation when you're talking and reading and studying the book of Revelation. But praise God, we don't have to go through that. Oh, that wasn't very loud either. Maybe some of you, maybe some of you have doubt on whether it's pre, mid, or post. Well, let me tell you something. The evil one can't come until the spirit leaves. And the spirit is you. The spirit's living in us. We are the body of Christ that is holding back the evil. So you can't be in evil times if you're the one that's holding back evil. You'll catch up. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very anxious for that catch up. Like I said last week, you're right on the edge. I'm telling you, you're right on the edge. Give God glory. He is going to move in a mighty way in his body, in his church. Because the church has been silent for too long. And if you don't believe me, look at what's happening in our church, in the body of Christ. Doors are shut and still shut. Many churches have closed permanently. That's sad. But that's only the beginning. Now, if that can happen from a man-made pandemic, whatever you call that, that man-made disease they call, they gave it a name. Do you ever notice that everything has to have a name? It has to have a name so that you know who you're fighting. So that you can speak to it by name. You remember Jesus said, to uh, the the demon, he says, what is your name? Why did he do that? So that he could speak to him face to face, knowing his name and who he was. Now watch what I do. Because I know you and you know me. Now who's more powerful? And those demons started crying out, don't kill us, don't kill us. Throw us over there in the pigs. Well, then the pigs ran off the cliff and they all died. So you take your choice. Me, I'm going to stick with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue on with this. Not so much on the focus on the presence of God, but I look at that every time we open up the word of God, we're in his presence. He loves his word. It never returns unto him void. It always accomplishes everything he set it out to do. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to your, in your Bible, to. Deuteronomy chapter 6. As I was preparing for this, and the Lord took me here, and I'm going, Lord, you know me in the Old Testament. I love history, but I don't stick in history. I want to I wanna know what 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 everything this side of the cross. I'm, I'm, I'm right there. I'm, I'm eager. I'm hungry. I'm, I want more of that. I want more of the Holy Ghost. I want more of the Spirit of God on me and the Word working and living in. And he goes, yeah, but it began here. 
And he, what really showed me in this scripture we're going to read is history repeating itself. Watch what happens here. Starting in verse 20, let's read 20 through 23. I guess I better get to it. All right. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is the meaning of the, of the testimonies? Now listen, listen very closely. And the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you. Then you say to your son, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all of his household. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in. I'm going to repeat that. He had to bring us out so that he could bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers, our forefathers. There's, a, there's, a, there's an understanding that comes with history. This is one of the reasons as we read these scriptures, we'll see that the same thing is repeating itself. See, all of this was taking place, and what was happening is God was reminding them to make sure you teach your sons and daughters the history of God's goodness, the God's faithfulness, God's trustworthiness. See, it's now in the same time. Right now, they're trying to take away our history. Why? So that our children are raised up with no foundation of truth. See, this is what this is all about. Raise your children up and speak of God's goodness. Speak of God's faithfulness. Speak of God's trustworthiness. That they may know that God, it was God that brought them out of Egypt. It was God that sustained them. And it was God who promised them a promised land. Woo! Are, you're not on fire yet? How can you just sit there? <laughs> just, woo! I'm having a hard time staying up here in front. Praise God. Woo! Glory to God. I thank you, Lord. Woo! You are so good. Okay. So as I was, like I said, as I was reading, so what do I mean? What am I trying to say here? <clears throat> as we... Here in verse 20, the importance of teaching. Oh, here we go. Let's go back to Miss Vicky. Huh? What is she doing? What is her calling? What is God blessing her with? The ability to teach our children. The same thing he gives to us, that we take his word and his salvation message. Man, whatever, you, plant it in your children. If you don't plant it anywhere else, plant it in your children. But as you start to plant that word of faith and that word of trust and that word of love and grace into our children, you'll start seeing it start to prosper. It will start to grow. And we're going to talk more about the roots and the built upon and so on and so forth as we get into this message. But I want you to focus on if you don't tell them, then the only ones they're hearing is the teachers in school. By the way, you ought to be very mindful about what's going on in our government in our House of the Senate and the House of Representatives right now when it comes to our children. Don't put a deaf ear there. Just like here, teach them. And we need to have the voice to let them know we're not putting up with your stuff no more. You're not going to teach this culture stuff. You're not going to teach all this racism and call the United States bad and evil. Because this whole world is supported by the goodness of this land, the United States of America, that was founded on the word of God. That's why everybody is so hungry to get here. If we're so bad, why do they want to come? That's not my message. As we have here in the scripture, sometimes God brings us out in order to bring us in. But that means he also has to allow us to go in. Here's something I want to say to you that I believe is very important. <clears throat> you know, in this world, Jesus said you will have trials and tribulations. But he didn't stop there. But he said, but be of good cheer. 
Now, if you stop right there, what Jesus is saying that I must be in good cheer while I'm in the trials and tribulations. Well, let me tell you something right now and get it off your chest. The trials are from God. It got quiet in here again. The trials are from God. They're not from the world. And I'm going to show you later on it's in Scripture. Amen? But this world that we're living in, yes, it has a lot of things that it's bringing at us. But at the same time, the Word of God is living in us. So as it comes at us, the Word of God should be coming up in us and flowing out of us and go, Whoa, I know the truth. I know the Word of God. And that's a lie. And I will not listen to it. But we have a hard time with understanding this sometimes because of the fact that what we do is we get so worked up and so involved in our life that we forget about who we are in Christ and what Christ did for us, that we don't have to go through those. And when we do go through those trials that God uh, opens up and says, here, go through this, I have a reason for this. If your kids, as you're raising them, if they never did anything wrong, what do they need you for? God knows we're going to have problems. We're going to have issues. We're going to fail. We're going to fall. He knew that from the beginning. I've heard many of people say, well, I got a question about God's love. And I go, okay. And they go, well, if he loved us so much, why did he put the tree in the middle of the garden? They go, see, that's temptation. I go, yeah, it is. But he gave us the will to choose. Here's all of this, but here's this one little item sitting here in the middle of the garden. Now, we don't know if it was apples, pears, oranges, or whatever it was. We just know it was a tree. But it was a tree of good and evil. We know its name. That if you eat of it, the eyes will be opened up to good and evil. And that will separate us from the love of God, from the presence of God. It's amazing. It's the same thing in life. These things that happen, God will allow them to happen in our lives to do what? To strengthen us, to lift us up, to show us of his goodness because we get so good in life that we get in those easy spots and we go, hey, you know what? I love life because I got no problems. So God says, oh, okay. What does it do? We went, whoa, where'd that come from? And all of a sudden, we start thinking, and we start operating. So what is this all about? What is the purpose of this? Did I do something wrong? God's going, no. And you're going, so what is this all about? He said, I just want to see how you'll react. I want to strengthen you in your walk. I want to let you know how much I love you. See, if I love you, I'm going to discipline you. Though The Bible talks about discipline. It says discipline. It does not say beat your children. It says discipline them. But how do we discipline them? In love. Why? Because we know if we don't keep them on the right track, they're going to get off on the wrong track. Amen? This, le- this world will do this. Uh, and here's a couple of verses for you. You don't have to go write them down in your notes. James 1, verse 12. These are all verses that we know. But again, what does the Bible talk about as strengthening us through our faith? Watch this. Blessed is the man who endures. Where's the blessing? The blessing comes in enduring the temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Do you see what's going on in this verse? There's the temptation. You make a choice. So we make the choice. But all it is is that choice of that temptation is, am I going to follow the Word of God? Am I going to focus on the Word of God? Am I going to focus on the presence of God? Or I'm going to step back go, woe is me. Now what do I do? And then I try to figure it out on my own. And every time I try to figure it out on my own, guess what I do? I get farther into the temptation. I get farther into trouble. Because my reliance and my trust is not in God. His word is faithful. Amen. How many times you heard that? God is faithful. James 1, verses 2 and 3. Watch this. Uh, Eric spoke it this morning. Brethren, count it all. 
Now, wait a minute. Let's take the all out of there. Count it joy when things are good, but when things aren't going so good, we just go, oh, woe is me. That's not what the scripture is saying. It says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Verse 3, knowing, oh, Lord, here it comes. Now, listen, the, we, always, we always focus on count it all joy. But watch the beginning of verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, I heard some moans. Anytime you mention the word patience, Christians moan. They do. <laughs> Oh, whatever you do in life, in this Christian life, do not pray for patience. <laughs> Obviously, most of you have not read the rest of the, the verses there, which I'm not going to go to because you already know. But patience produces. Through the trial, we gain patience. We we have a knowledge of God's love and we trust his word. So therefore, so what does patience really mean? Trust. Literally, all it means is trust. Trust in what? In the word of God. Trust in the promises. We've heard over and over throughout our lives, how many promises has God made? They're in the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. The promises, how many do we know? But yet it's in the trials and in these times of testing that God reveals to us, you need more of me. If you hang on to me, if you hold on to my word, watch, I will lead you right through it. We're going to go on. I'm going to get to it. But it's through patience or waiting on the Lord that we receive the wisdom and the true understanding on how to go through rather than just endure it for the moment. See, we can get through it for the moment. How many know what I'm talking about is down the line it's going to come back. Why? Because I didn't endure it to its fullness. I didn't wait on the Lord. I didn't seek after the Lord. I didn't seek after his face. I didn't seek after his word. I, I went so far, and then I turned around and did it on my own. But I got through it. So where's the trust? Where's the patience? Where's the love for God and his word? See, our, we went back to that soul man. See, I, I, I've been through this. I know how to figure it out. I don't need God is basically what we're saying. I can do this on my own. First Peter <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 7, one we all know, so that the testing, the tested Genuine, the gen, genuineness, excuse me, of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested. He's talking about the gold. Even though the gold is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor of the revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And no, I'm not talking about the book of Revelation. I'm talking about the revelation that we receive from God through the testing of our faith. How do I get through it? God says, trust me. Seek me. Seek my face. Seek my understanding. I keep going back to Isaiah 55, 8. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher. But what God is saying is in the first part of that chapter is that God is the supplier. Come up here. Don't remain down here on earth. I've already given you all the blessings, all the spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I've given you my wisdom. I've given you my spirit who knows all things. Yes, even the deep things of God. So there again, in understanding, if this is our source, why wouldn't we go to our source? Instead, our human man steps back up, that soul man steps back up in power and authority, and he starts saying, well, we can do it this way. This would be a lot easier and faster. We don't have to worry about patience. Amen? 
And of course, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has, listen very closely, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. So that means that there's a limitation on it, doesn't it? In other words, if you're going through it, somebody else has been through it. It's not something that's focused, and it's only on you. God is focusing on you, or this trial is all about you. It's not just about you. And therefore, we understand the Word says that all common men go through it. But watch. But, here comes the but. We all got one of those, too. You missed that one. God is faithful. But God is faithful. Man, we got to hold on to these words. This is God's words. This is not me speaking. This is God speaking through uh, uh, the Apostle Paul here in, Cor in Corinth. It says, God is faithful who will not, will not. That means hold on to this. This is a promise. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. Oh, man, you know, the world won't give you that kind of a promise. They'll, the world will strip you of everything. If you try to seek the wisdom of men, it will strip you of everything that you have. In fact, they're trying to do it right now. But see, when we have faith that is founded on the Word of God, they cannot take that away because that's a promise from Almighty God. That is not a promise from man. It's not a promise from our governor. It's not a promise from our president. It's a promise from Almighty God. And God is faithful. His word is true, and it's always yes and amen. Woo! No temptation has overtaken you such as common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Now watch, it goes on, doesn't stop there. But with the temptation, listen, but with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There is so much being said in this one scripture. It is so powerful. But there's been so many times that we take things that God says out of context. And the first thing we start looking for is the way out. Well, God promised me a way out. We did. But he's also testing us to go through, to wait on him. Let him show you the way out. It might be halfway through the temptation. It might be all the way at the end, but who cares? If I'm following God and I'm listening to him and he is my source and he is my, my comforter and my joy and my peace and everything, I'm going to keep my eyes focused on him. I'm not going to be looking for a door of escape. I'm going to tell you there is none. Until you get to the one that he provides. See, I've said this over and over. We are a fast food junkie. This is the way we live nowadays. Everything is now, 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 now. And what did God say? That we need to have patience. Stop. No. My God is faithful. My God is true to his word. And I will wait on him because when I wait on him, the answer that I get is the perfect answer for my situation. Not the one I'm hoping I get, but the one he knows I need because it will build me up in my holy faith. It will build me up in the word of God, in the trusting of God. Amen? Come on, you can say amen. But I think too many times we've, we've uh, allowed... or. Uh, Teachers have taught that, hey, don't worry about it. God's going to give you a way out. And so when people get into temptation, the first thing they start looking for is a way out. Isn't that the way we are? But he says the temptation is it's common to man. Everybody goes through this. It's not something that's just focused on you. Everybody goes through it. But God is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Follow me. I will make you fishers of men. I will reveal myself, my goodness, my fullness, my faithfulness, my healing, my joy, my peace. All that I am are yours. Seek me. But leaning in the, learning in the test that the way has and always will be the same way, the same road that Jesus had to follow.
Uh oh. It's always pointing toward Jesus. As we read this Bible, as we begin here in, in Deuteronomy and we go all the way through the book of Revelation, it all points to Jesus. Every bit of it, all about Jesus. So in every temptation, every testing that we go through, through the steps of life, it will always move. If we're patiently waiting and trusting God, he will always move us toward him, never away from him. Always toward him. Turn with me. Oh, by the way, the road that Christ took, we all know where that ended. At the cross. Now we're talking about the Son of God. I remember my brother having an encounter with God. He said, Pete, did I not love my son? I said, oh, yeah, you loved him. And I crucified him. What makes you think I won't, and I'm shortening it. What makes you think I won't crucify you? Now, see, the first thing we think of is, oh, my goodness, would God do that to me? I hope I'm worthy. That's the position that I want to be in. That when, if I ever heard that, here I am, use me. Am I worthy of that kind of love and sacrifice? Knowing that beyond the cross was eternal life. And that people would be drawn to that crucifixion and that man called Jesus. And new life would come out of that. A relationship with Almighty God would come out of that suffering and that crucifixion. Stop and think about it. And yet we want the easy way out. Fast food. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Anybody getting anything out of this? Woo! If you're not, I am. I enjoy it. I keep enjoying more and more and more and more. <laughs> I keep wondering, when is God going to run out of word for me to speak? That's the day I go home to be with him. Amen? Amen. Chapter 2, starting in verse 6, let's read 6 through 14, and then we'll come back and discuss this. Uh, starting verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Paul is trying to tell us something very, very important. If you have received salvation, walk in him. Not walk on your own. Not take your own path. But follow him. Let's read on. I know I stopped. Have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. As you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and uh, empty deceit. According to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all. Everybody say all. There's nothing left, nothing lacking, nothing short. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete. Say, I am complete. Why? Because I'm complete in him, not on my own. On my own, I am nothing, and I can do nothing. But in Christ Jesus, I can do. Well, most of you got it. I know. I throw things at you, and you wonder, do you want me to say it, or are you just being funny up there. No, I want you to say it. Speak it out. Shout it out. Because we can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. Amen? Amen. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Did you hear that? He's the head of all principality and power. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, but putting off of the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. We've been made new. All the old stuff has been cut off. And yes, there's still more to be cut. But as we keep pressing in, the more, the more we press in, the more starts falling on. 
You know this from the moment you, you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You knew you're going, okay, I, be, I, I feel so good. I feel different. But you were expecting this pizzazz. Well, the pizzazz took place inside. And now God starts forming us from the inside out into his likeness and into the same um, um, image of Christ. We're being transformed. Transformed doesn't mean quick fix. Transformed means changing in a process of changing from who we were to who God has planned us to be. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29 11 says that he has a plan for us. He has a way for us. He has, has things for us that he's planned for us to do. If we don't change more into Christ and listen to and seek his face and listen to him, how will he ever reveal his plan? You think he's going to send you a text? If you do, let me know. So I can expect mine. <laughs> okay. Um. Where was I? Let's go back to um, uh, verse 7. I want to I go back to verse 7 for a minute. As we read verse 6, it says, Therefore you receive Christ as Lord, walk in him. And then watch. I want to focus on this. Rooted and built up. We read these words. You know I'm a, I'm a fanatic on certain words that the, the Spirit all of a sudden just brings into my vision. And I start seeking after that word. We understand in the natural what it means to be rooted. Do you understand what it means to be rooted in the supernatural, in the spirit? Rooted. Listen to this. Now, this comes out of the dictionary. To plant and fix. I highlighted that word and darkened it so it would stand out. It's not just to take a plant, but to fix the roots. Fix the roots in good soil. So there's a preparation that must take place in order for the seed to get in down deep into the soil and feel the, all the nourishment of the soil. And then he starts to sprout those roots. And it starts seeking and seeking and seeking and seeking. If the roots don't seek, the seed, the plant will die. Now you know why I'm so focused on the root. We need to understand the root, that that root is an important part of our Christian walk. Where are we rooted and grounded? Where are we truly rooted into? Are we rooted in part into our Christian life and our relationship with God? But God, you have to understand, I have a life to live here on earth. Well, he knows that. He created it. He just didn't create it the way we live it. He created it perfect, and we made a mess out of it. But we're learning to get rooted into the word, rooted into good soil. Remember the teaching of Jesus when he talked about the seed and where it would fall. And it's walk, it falls on the wayside. It falls on stony ground. It falls in the midst of thorns and the thorns overtake it. But then he says, when the seed falls into good soil. So that tells me there's something that I need to do. And as farmers or as people that have gardens or even raise flowers or whatever it is we do, we understand that there has to be a churning of the soil. Farmers do not walk out there and go, and you ladies that plant those beautiful roses and tulips and everything else, don't go out and go, good luck. I'm expecting a harvest. But no, there's something that that farmer or that person needs to do. And as Christians, we need to operate in that same understanding. We must prepare this soil. Did you prepare your soil this morning to read the rooted, implanted word of God into a deeper position? Because you tended the soil and you've made everything ready so that root can go deeper and deeper and deeper. How the soil or the ground must be prepared and tended to in order for the seed to take root. And when it takes root, it starts to produce. Amen? So this part is our responsibility. John 15, you don't have to go there, just listen. John 15, 5 says, I am the vine and you are the branches. 
He who abides in me, Jesus is saying, he who is rooted in me, take hold of me. Don't let anybody break your branch. Don't let anybody pull on it to where it gets a crack and it becomes separated a little bit because the more the wind blows and the storms of life come, it starts to peel that branch farther and farther. Next thing you know, the branch is hanging on by dear life. And sometimes we get into that kind of condition in our life. We're just hanging there, holding on for dear life, holding, hoping someone will come along and put a Band-Aid on us, Band-Aid that will wrap us up. Because now let me tell you something. If you, get, if you get someone or if you yourself take that branch and you put it back in its rightful place and mend and tend to it, it will reattach and start receiving from the main part of the tree which we know to be Jesus. Amen. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. See, it's a two-way street. Are we seeking after God's presence, after Jesus' presence? See, we can be followers of Christ, but never seek after his presence. He who abides in me and I am him, watch, bears much fruit. Not just the sprout or two, but much fruit. For without me, now listen, this is Jesus speaking to us. For without me, you can do nothing. I don't know about you, but when my Savior, the Savior of the world, tells me that if I'm not attached and if I'm not seeking him and holding on to him and staying affirmed with him, I won't produce any fruit. And whatever trial and tribulation I get into, I won't have what I need to get through. Why? Because he's my supplier. He's the one I hold on to. He's the one I cling to. He's the one I wait on, the one I have patience for, trusting he's going to show up. He's going to bring me the answer. He's going to bring me down the right path. He's going to lead me home to victory. Amen? Woo! The roots are essential not only for the plant, but the roots are essential for you and I in our spiritual growth. We must truly stay connected, and then we must maintain. That's what I'm saying. When we look at farmers, Jesus used to speak a lot about the farmland. You ever notice that? Because our Christian life is very, very similar to planting and harvesting. In order to get a harvest, you must, first of all, work the soil, plant the seed, and then you must maintain it. You must water it. You must take care of it. We all know if we don't go out and do our weeding, if we don't water, what's going to happen? We sit there and go, okay, God, I planted. Where's my harvest? And then as we start sitting back and watching these plants do everything they can to to break ground. (laughs) I know I'm a little dramatic. To break ground. I just want to. I just want to seek the, the light. I, 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 I want to come up out of the ground and seek that beautiful sunshine. And now they come out and they see the sunshine, and the sunshine burns them because there's no water to cause them to get down in the ground and create more roots that go deeper and deeper and deeper. How's that stalk? Look at a stalk of, of um, um, corn. I mean, six, eight, nine feet tall. How far does the root have to go to hold that stalk up? And especially when it starts putting four or five or six uh, ears of corn on it. Do you really trust God? The answer can only be answered from within. How much do I trust him? How much do I lean on him? Lean on me when you're not strong. That's a worldly song, but you know what? It's got a lot of truth in it. Jesus is the me. That's a capital M-E. Lean on me. Lean on him. He will always see you through. Jeremiah 17, verses 8 and 9, another one to write down. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Now, here again, we hear these scriptures and we, we, we read these scriptures, and I hope you're reading them over and over and over and over till they get so down deep and rooted in your spirit, man, that every time we get into that trial, we go, oh, yeah. The Bible says, do you remember the the, uh, trials of Jesus? Did he ever say to Satan, because he knew who he was, he watched him fall. 
You think this just took place for reading in the Bible? No, it's to show us that it's through the word of God that strength comes. That through that trial, we have the authority and the uh, word of God to get through it. Jesus said to Satan, thus says the Lord. Thus says the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. He always went to the word of God. He never once said, dude, you know who I am? I created you. See, that's what man would do. That's what I would do. I've told you that before. That's what I would do. I just get that pride thing out and start standing up and going, dude, you got no way to move me. Well, guess what? By me saying that, he moved me. He beat me. Because he's after the word that's in us. And when we start bringing our pridefulness and our our humanness up, and we start standing on our own strength, and we start fighting the battle, we're, we also have lost the armor. We've lost the, the favor of God, the, the word of God, the strength of the word. Speak the word. Let the word do the battle. God has already sent it out to accomplish, not to maintain or hopefully get the job done. The word says, I sent my word out, and it does not return unto me void, but accomplishes all I sent it out to do. So out of the abundance of our heart comes what? The word of God. Speak the word. But see, if the word is not in us and it's not producing fruit, then what happens is is we go, well, I don't really know the Bible that well. Well, I'm going to share with you something that I think is very important. It's a little bit different than what my message is about. First of all, you better start clinging to God. Seeking his face, seeking his presence, seeking his word. But if, if, if you have a difficult time with that, cling on somebody who does. That's why God created the church. The body of Christ It's called to exalt and exhort one another, to lift one another, encourage one another, to love on one another, to help them in a time of need. Help them through that trial, through that, that testing, that time, so that they rise up, not where we grab a hold of them and start hugging on them and run them with them, and then we take them to the finish line. This is what the world does. We pick them up, run with them, set them down at the finish line. Oh, you good thing, you, you good runner. You're so fast. Here's a trophy. Sorry. Didn't mean to go back there again. Blessed be the one who trusts in the Lord whose, listen, listen to this word, whose confidence. Oh, I trust God. Well, how much confidence do you have in him? See, trust we can we, we kind of take that for granted. Yeah, I, tr- I, tr- I trust that chair. You know, I got trust. You know, it's like I sit down in that chair. I expect it to hold me up. But do you have confidence in it? Especially if you're looking at an old one that's been through the mill. Think about that one. Verse 8, for he shall be like a tree planted by the water. Oh, listen to this verse. Please, please, please. A tree that is planted by the water that sends out its roots. Did the tree move? No. But as the, 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 everything that nourishes and brings flavor and growth and strength and fruit to this tree comes through the roots. <laughs> and what do the roots do? According to this scripture. These roots go out. It sends its roots out from the tree to the river. I like this this translation here. The river, not a trickle of water, a watering hole, but a river. Because that's my God. He's a river. He's the river of life. It will never run dry. Can this be a a form of seeking? Oh, I think so. Do not, do not roots seek out the water and its source? Not just the water, but they keep going deeper to get to its source. Why? Because when you get to its source, you'll never run out of water. You'll never have another need. 
because the water is there. It's supplied. You reach the source. Oh, when we reach the source, which is God's presence, the word of God, the living truth, when we reach the source, we will never run out of water. We will never run out of the things of life that we need to get through this life because we know there's another place. We know there's a better place that he has planned for us, but we got to get through this one. And how do we do that? By allowing our, our forcing, making our roots, do maintaining everything around us so those roots do not get hindered. <sighs> and we'll not fear when heat comes. <laughs> Boy, I could take this one and run with it, couldn't you? Anybody feeling the heat? I don't, you know, when, you're, when your tree is planted by the river, you look out and you see lots of water. But if you're not, you haven't reached the source yet. The river's running on top of the ground. The source of the water comes from underneath. The cool water comes from underneath. And then you understand as that tree by the living water, you turn around and you know that you never have to worry about the heat. Hmm. Got plenty of water. But it's the leaves. Its leaves are always green. Why? Why are the leaves of the trees always green? Now, I'm not talking about change. Don't go thinking about wintertime when they all fall off. That tree still remains. But we just talked about heat. And it's the leaves that draw moisture and draw health and strength from the water, from the source. And therefore, you have shade so you don't have to worry about the heat. Whew. And it has no worries in a year of drought. <laughs> Are we in a, a year of drought? Come on. Huh? You can answer. The answer is yes. And we shout it out go, oh, man, you betcha. We're in a year of drought. You don't know where your next job is coming from. You don't know whether you'll have a bank account next month. You don't know if you'll have a welfare check next month. Or if your welfare card is any good next month. I'm just being blunt and boastful because it's true. That's what's wrong with the world today. That's why the world today is turning away from God and turning to government. The idols of men, that they are your source. They are the ones that provide. Let me tell you something. They are not the source. They're only the water that's running on the top of the ground. But when that source dries up and that valve is turned off, they have no other choice but to cut you off. Because they, they can print more money, but they have nothing to back it up. They can provide you with health, but it's according to what they have and what they desire to give you and allow you to have. Come on, you all know all the way through history, as you study history, always the powerful overtake the weaker. The Bible tells us that the, power, the stronger to take care of the weak. But man says, no, 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 we take care of ourselves. And you're, you, you're, hey, is what it is. Sorry. But anyway, then skipping down to verse 10, it says, I, the Lord. Now listen, listen. I, the Lord, search the heart. Remember what I said back, I don't remember what time it is, but 15 minutes or so ago, I said the Lord is the one who does the testing. And there might have been a few ears that went, Wait a minute, you know, you're saying God puts us through a test? Listen to the word of God. You ready? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. You know, you know when, does it really say that? Look it up. Look it up. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart, and I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. See, the word always confirms word. 
The word is always the truth. If somebody says something, don't ever take it that that is the truth. You've heard me say this all the time. Things that I say, it's backed by Scripture. I read the Bible. I have the Bible open. I'm quoting the Bible. Yes, I have an iPad that has my notes and stuff on it, but the truth of the Word comes from the Word of God. And there it is. Read it. Let those roots get down deep in there. Let God start watering that tree to where that tree starts to grow even more powerful and all the leaves that grow off of those branches and begin to shade that tree and the ground underneath of it so that the ground doesn't get hard and, 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 and the heat sucks all the water out of it and the roots dry. That's what's happening to us today because we choose to sit back in our state of comfort because we're the United States. We're blessed by God. Hmm. In Coloss or excuse me, Ephesians 3.17, the New Living Translation says it this way, then Christ will make his home in your heart as you trust him. Oh, well, I thought, I thought, he, he was there, and, and, and he's always there, and he's always He is. He's taken up residency. Remember, we spoke about this last week. This is the temple of the living God. See, we don't have to build a temple to God. We are the temple of God when we receive Jesus Christ. But yet at the same time, if you look back through history, what happened to the elect, those chosen by God to be the nation that would take the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to the rest of the world? What happened to them? Wasn't God with them? By day and by night. Remember when he brought them out of Egypt? Nobody died. Nobody got sick. Their sandals didn't even wear out. Why? Because God was with them. God supplied their needs. But see, when they turned on God, when they rebuked God, and they did all the calf thing, the gold took all the blessings of God that he gave to them, that they, it, it said, get all that stuff from Egypt. He just says, get it, just get out of here. And they took what God blessed them with, and they made a calf. And they worshiped the calf. Hey, wouldn't you get mad? Wouldn't you be disappointed in your people? So he said, fine. He said, you see that mountain over there? Go walk around it for about 40 years. But who supplied them? Did they die? Yes, they died. He took that off of it. But who supplied their need? God. Was there water in the desert? Well, there was once God got done with it. Where'd the food come from? But see, he waited for the old ones to die off. And once they died off, it took 40 years to weed out all the stuff. There's a test here. They had to be tested. And so God allowed them to walk around for 40 years. Could you imagine? Same. same didn't we just pass that rock? Ten days ago, yep, St. Rocks. For 40 years. And then all of a sudden comes a new generation. And some of the fathers were told, still talking about the promises of God, the promise of a promised land. And all of a sudden, one of them said, and it flows with milk and honey. And one of them youngsters stood up and said, what's milk and honey? I know water. And I know manna, but what's milk and honey? I'm using that as a paraphrase. We know they had animals. But what I'm saying is, is what is the goodness of God? What, what is in that land that we definitely don't see walking around this mountain for 40 years or however long they've been walking? It's the presence of God. It's the promise of God. Continue on in Colossians uh, verse two or chapter two and verse seven. Remember, we talked about the root. I know I'm running out of time, but hang on for just a few more minutes more. I want to get through this rooted and built up. It's so important that we understand that we be rooted in the foundation of God. We be rooted in the promise of God, rooted in His Word that He will not fail us. How do you know? 
If you don't go through the test, how will you ever know? That's how much God loves us. He wants us to know that he's always there. I'll take care of all of your needs according to my riches and glory. But in verse 7 there, it talks about um, chapter 2, verse 7, rooted and built up. What does it mean, built up? Now, most of us can understand this who have ever been in any kind of um, um, construction work or anything. You have to have a foundation. And once you have a foundation, then you start building your house. So to use something as a foundation, this is what I loved about this explanation, to use something as a foundation. What are you using for the foundation of your life? Some of you here may have thought you were a Christian and you've been trying to do your best, but maybe you still haven't truly understand what it's like to have a relationship with the foundation that's never going to move, that's always there. And whatever you build on it, it will withstand it. It will hold on to it. It will hold it up. To use something as the foundation on which to construct something else. That's a powerful word right there. Amen? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. It's one you all know. Quickly. As quick as you can. I'll wait on you. Even though I have it all written out here on my iPad, I always like to go to the Word because I want to make sure it's all right. Sometimes I make mistakes. <laughs> God knows I'm not perfect. But I'm getting there. <laughs> And one day I will be. Verse 24, therefore, I'm in chapter 7, verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them. So is Jesus saying we have to do something? See, don't be hearers, but be doers. That's what James says. Don't be hearers of the word. Don't come here and just hear the word and then walk out the door and expect for it to be a good, solid foundation to build your life on. Remember, we have to remain rooted in order to build up, okay? So, um, therefore, uh, whoever hears these words of my, sayings of mine and does them, I will like him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, like I said, I know you all know this, but I need you to hear this. We're talking about building something up. In order to build something up, you have to have a foundation. And it's got to be something that will hold up. No matter what the test of time, it will always hold up. And if we're holded and rooted onto that foundation, if we're bolted down, no matter how high our house goes, that foundation will hold. That's my God. Oh, verse 25, and the rains descended. Okay, does this sound like life? Huh? As soon as you became a Christian, did the rain come? And I'm not talking about the holy rain. I'm talking about the rain of life, the storms of life, the winds of life. Did they start coming? You bet you they start coming. Because what Satan is trying to do is steal, kill, and destroy the word of God that has been implanted in you. Watch what happens. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. But it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. And that rock is Jesus. Amen. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. Listen closely, people. He's talking to us. This might have been 2,000 and some years ago, but he's speaking to us today. We can't sit back in our pew, in our comfort zone, and go, whatever will be, will be. But I know where I'm going. Praise God, you know where you're going. But are you having a relationship with the one who made the way for you to go? And does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Did you hear that? See, we can hear it, but if we don't create, if we don't create, if, if we don't create in us a good solid foundation on the Word of God, then what happens? Watch what happens next. It's like building your ha house on the sand. How many how many people here know that if you build a house on the sand, every time the world the world shifts a little bit or this little thing comes out, it starts to rock and roll. Why? Because there's no foundation. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell. And great was its fall. 
This is important. Underline this in your scriptures. Jesus says, if you don't do what is you hear, great is your fall. Hmm. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. And the rains descended, and great was its fall. Oh, how true these words are of wisdom uh, that for us today, not only as individuals, but there again, I always speak as, a, as, as the body of Christ. I don't just speak of me or you individually. I speak as the body, as the whole, because we make up the whole. And if one of us is, is falling or one of us is hurting, that's what the rest of the body is for, is to come alongside that person and edify and lift them up and hold them up. Today we can see that houses of faith have been given way to the storms of life. I'm telling you, this is true. Houses of God have given way to the storms of life. They believe the lie. They believe the deception. Why? Because they have no foundation. They're not rooted and seeking after the source of that running water that's right there, right in front of them. But rather than, than seeking the source, they go and try and get lip service off of the water. In many churches, that's what you're getting today is lip service. How is it that Mario said it? Um, something about skinny jeans and what? Fog machines, skinny jeans, and whatever else. But it's sure not the word of God. It's a it's a word that's been twisted. the The meat of it has been removed because they don't want you to feel sad. They don't want you to be offended. Well, let me tell you something. That will never happen as long as I'm pastor of this church. Because, you know, I will tell you, I'm sorry if it offends you. But let's sit down and discuss the word of God because I want you to know the truth. I want your foundation in your walk with Christ to be so strong that whatever this world brings at you, that's that windstorm that's coming, that falling rain that's coming, and the storms of life that come up against you and start beating on you, and yes, even the floods, let the floods come. If we're founded in the word of God, we're founded on Jesus Christ, your house will not move. Rain has the power to cause a leak in your roof. <laughs> Anybody got leaks in your roof? You found out this morning. Huh? Isaiah 46, uh, 4, 6 says, There will be a shelter to give shade for the heat by day and, refu and refuge and protection by the storm and the rain. God is our refuge. Founded and rooted in him. Amen. There's so much more I want to tell you, but I know I'm running out of time, and I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to hold you. But... Listen, Ecclesiastes, uh, Eric mentioned Ecclesiastes this morning. Listen, uh, chapter 7, verse 12. For wisdom, listen, for wisdom is protection just as money to protection, is protection. But the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom perceives, uh, preserves the lives of its possessors. Huh? Wisdom of what? Wisdom of the world? Hey, if you're hanging on to the wisdom of the world because you can get it faster and it's right there in front of you and they just keep throwing at you, you better go to the source and make sure that it's the truth. You know, we're so busy seeking the Internet and the sources that come. You know, this is all this is. You do understand that this is a, a prophecy coming to fulfillment. That people will have all kinds of wisdom but not the true wisdom. It's the wisdom of men. It's the wisdom of this world and not the wisdom of God. And they'll seek after that wisdom, and they sit there, and our children. I, I've got a, a two-year-old grandson, man, that can work that phone like nobody's business. And I have a hard time turning them on. Well, no, really, I have a more hard time turning them on. But the wind can be a force that shakes the walls, and even the strongest house has troubles. And I can give you scripture for that, uh, Acts 27, 13 to 15. 
And it talks about, remember we talked about it a, 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 about a month ago when we talked about Paul when he was on the ship. And um, they got it. They, Paul tried to tell him, don't, don't sail yet. But everything, listen, everything looked good until they got out on the sea. And all of a sudden, the storm came. And everybody was doing their thing along the sides and worrying about life and started chucking everything over and everything. And then, you know, we know Paul had a word from God. But there was still a trial, wasn't there? There was still a test. But God is faithful to his word. And even when the snake, when the, when the viper latched onto his arm, he just shook it off. Why? Because he had a promise from God. You have a promise from God. Hold on to your promise. Get your roots down deep, deep, deep into the deep things of God and let God be the source of our wisdom. Let God be the source of our overcoming the storms of life. You will get through this. God has promised. But God is faithful. We must remain faithful to him. Do we truly trust him? Am I, conv am I convinced and am I convicted that he will see me through the storm? That no matter, even if a viper latches onto my arm, man, just shake that dude off. Because you have an appointment. You have a promise from God. Amen? Amen. Like I said, there's more. We'll, maybe we'll continue it next week. We'll see. Depends on the Holy Ghost. He always gives me more than I need. Oh, did you hear that? Huh? He always gives me more than I need so that I have an abundance and I never run short. It's the same thing with you. But see, we can't do that if we're not feeding on the Word. And letting the word fill us and understanding who we are and what Christ has done for us. That we, wow, if he was raised from the dead, his word says I'll be raised from the dead too. Oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? You know what you're saying? You know what he's saying? Bring it on. I know in who I believe and who I trust. And I know where I'm going because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you. Oh, how we glorify you. We just give you all the praise and the glory. And Father, it's, our, our praises are not worthy. They're not enough for all that you have done and all you continue to do in our lives. And we, we just humbly come before you and say, Father, we just, we just love you. And we thank you for all that you have done. And we just seek after more of you. Father, show us how we can prepare this ground where it's sufficient for our roots to grow so deep that we get to the source. And then, the, well, your word says that it's an abundance of flow, not a trickling. It's an abundance. And it's an abundance for every need, for every trial, every tribulation. You say that you, you prepared a door. You have a door of escape. So why are we looking for a door when we've got you? You are the door of life and life eternal. Don't let us take that and use it according to man's way of thinking. But according to your way of thinking your way of processing this and understanding this, that this is the door. My son is the door. Jesus says, I am the door of life. Your food, your word is the food of life. And it doesn't just feed us for the moment, but it overflows and just continues to process deeper and deeper and just out of the abundance of a man's heart, because we're so fixed on the Word of God and on your presence that every time we open up our mouth, out comes the Word of God. Whether it's to bring joy or whether it's to do battle, the Word is sufficient for all our needs. It was for Jesus. It is for me. And Father, we thank you. And I thank you for each one of those that have stuck it out. We might have got a little, little long-winded today, but, Father, it's all your word. It's all true, and it's all refreshing. Your word is refreshing, just like that cool water 
that just refreshes us in a time of need. And we know that we're in a time of need. But we need more of you, not more of what this world has. We got plenty of that. But what we need is more of you. And Father, I thank you for each one of these hearts, each person that's here today, and those that will be watching on the internet when this is posted. Father, we just give you all the glory and the praise. We just love you and thank you for loving us first. And we just give you glory. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen.